Happy Sunday. I want to say a few things about what Brother Richard has shared earlier. He reminded me of the seven habit of highly effective people. I, I think I share a little bit about that, right, from Stephen Covey, uh, who is like a Mormon guy. So in his most popular book, one of the things that he listed is the way you spend time. And then he, he segregated time into four quadrants. The first one is important and urgent. Then the second one is important, not urgent. Third one is not important but urgent. Last one is not important, not urgent. So if you know this quadrant thing, the idea is that you are to focus a lot of your life on the important but not urgent. So there are many things in life that's very important but not urgent. For example, visiting your mother is important but not exactly urgent. Uh, so you focus on that. And then you are to manage things that are important and urgent. Like you go into work, there's a lot of email coming out, a lot of important things and urgent. You've got to manage them because if you don't, then you get into trouble, right? They are important and urgent. What you want to spend the least time doing will be things that are not important and not urgent, like surfing the internet and watching YouTube and Korean drama show and all that. That's not important, not urgent. The problem is that we are always drawn into that area like a moth to a candlelight, you know, and that include myself, uh, by the way. <laughs> and so you spend your time surfing the net and you watch that kitten run through the door or that mouse cleaning himself or whatever it is. And the whole internet is set up like that. Some people say internet is invented for cats <laughs> so that you can put up more and more cute little hamster running in a wheel or something like that. But nonetheless, from time to time, you do catch some glimpses of wisdom, I would say. And we have to admit, like TED Talk and all that, these are some of the things that are quite interesting. And also, you, you do get to find out a lot about how other people think and how other people operate. But it's a highly inefficient way to gain knowledge because you've got to spend one hour to find one or two <laughs> nice little quotations. The rest of the time is like, ah, <laughs> you're just surfing the net that way. But it takes a lot of, of effort. And what Richard has pointed out is one of the things that are really coming into track these few days, uh, these few decades. And the idea of decluttering and having a simpler lifestyle because of the overwhelming wave of consumerism that is, that is covering us. So a lot of people are recognizing that, you know, it's not about the things, it's about people. And so a senior pastor always say, the correct order of our life always must be God, followed by people, followed by things. Our problem is that we do it the other way around. We put things first, then followed by people, and then we always put God last. And when you get the correct order of life, you put God first, you put people second, and things last, then inevitably your life will be a lot more simple. And that will bring about a lot more blessings in life, a lot less anxiety. And so, like with the young couples that are coming before me for marital prep course, I always tell them, you know, are you the people who are attracted by blinks? Meaning blinking things is very important to you. And for the women, it's the blinking stone, right? For the men, it's usually the blinking car or something like that. So if you are not attracted to blinking things, your life will be a lot easier. Isn't it true? Because if you are attracted to blinking things, I must have that piece of stone that is blinking like nobody's business. Or I must have that car that is that's shining, you spend all your time thinking about that, you have to spend a lot of energy to achieve things like that, you will find then that your life becomes very complicated because if you don't have those things, then you get really upset with your husband or with your wife or with your life and you get bitter and you will find that your life will be gone before you know it. You know, one of the other things that I do other than preaching to you would be the charitable work I do for Habitat. And recently, we've come across a few interesting cases, hoarders who hoard all kinds of things. Just last week, we went to this guy's house, and this is a man who's staying alone, and his house is in a terrible stage because he keeps hoarding things. So we kept trying to help him to declutter his house. And guess what? We discovered gold bars. Yeah. You know, I, I ask them to go ascertain whether it's real or not. It looks real to me, you know. Uh, we discover go bus. But this guy's life is in a complete mess because he's dysfunctional and family members want to be with him. It's all alone, he's cranky, he's crazy. And, but he got go bus, you know. So he has a lot of things, and not only things, but really expensive things. And yet, 
the entire life is in in a mess. So at the end of the day, what is he going to do? Hug his gold bar and, and, and die? Is that what's going to happen in his life? So I pray that the Lord, even through the sharing that Richard has done, will remind us once again that it's not about things. Uh, it's about people. And so do not use people and then love things. But you need to love people and things are just tools. And it, I, I spend some time talking about this because it's kind of related to the passage this morning. We are going through the main theme of the Old Testament. So let's go through the last lesson. Last lesson was at the dividing point of Genesis. Before Genesis chapter 12, we call it the primeval history, the creation and all that. And from chapter 12 onwards come uh, Abraham. And as usual, we always want to draw the lesson from the Old Testament and also contrast it with some New Testament passage. So the last lesson was Galatians 3, 6 to 9, and we are talking about the call of Abraham. And I spent some time trying to explain, especially to Christians, that Abraham was a character that is important in not only Christianity, but in many major faiths, the Abrahamic faith in Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And from the anger of the outside world, Abraham was important because he was the one person who advocated strongly the idea of monotheism, which means that there is only one God. And again, for us, it seems most obvious, but not so, you know, for the rest of the world where polytheism, pantheism, deism, well, a lot of ism out there, many different concepts of what God would be like or the gods should be like. But Abraham was the first person who advocated strongly that there is but one God. But of course, this was revealed to him by God himself, not something that he figured out by himself, but in the history of mankind, that's still considered most important. But more importantly, the Bible described Abraham in some really wonderful way. The Bible called him the friend of God and also the father of all who have faith. So in a very real sense, Abraham was the father of all, all of us too in the spiritual sense. But we wanted to look at the call of Abraham and some of the key lessons in the call. And the four lessons that I brought up was, number one, that we see from the call of Abraham that God works largely through human agent. Because the call of Abraham was done by God to demonstrate his will through this family, through the family of Abraham and his deeds. And this is what Genesis 18 points out to us. So that was the, the key purpose. And God could have done it anyway, right? But he chose to do it through us. So that's the thing that we need to remember, that it will be so true for us in life, that God can do anything he wants, but he has chosen to work through us. Therefore, if we choose to do nothing, God will hold us accountable for the life that he has given to us. This is a very, very important point for you to remember. And it is also a very important reform evangelical point, a very distinctive part of the reform understanding of the theology of work. And not only that, the call of Abraham demonstrated that when God calls, he largely would do that by showing us the immediate next step. Because Abraham was called to do such a mighty task to be the father of all who have faith, but God did not show him the next step after the first step. God just said, you come out, I'm going to bring you to a place, a promised land. That's about it. You know, it doesn't tell him where's the map or what happened or the resources given to him, nothing. It was just a simple one-step call. And most of the time in our journey of faith, that would be the case as well. So when God calls us or when God gives a plan to us, you have that one step. Like when you get married, you only know that the next step is your wedding. After that, what will happen, you really don't know. And so it's a one-step process, but it's not just a blind call because God also works by guaranteeing the outcome of His call with His many, many promises. Remember, I told you that I some of the, the research I've done show that there are Anything from 1,500 promises in the Bible to some people claiming 12,000 in the Bible. Most likely about 2,000 or so promises in the Bible. And God has not broken a single one of His promise. And the last point is God works largely through people who are willing to obey. We know this because Abraham was not just someone who got nothing better to do, very desperate, very poor, and God was rescuing him. No, he was a person who was very wealthy. And not only that, the later chapter show you that he was also a person who was like a warrior. So he was like really capable kind of a guy 
And yet when God called, he willingly obeyed and he went. And so we learned the lesson indeed that through the scripture, we see that to be almost the way God works all the time. I said almost because sometimes there are exceptions. The apostle Paul was an exception. He was like most unwilling to serve God. But, and God really chastised him, right? But most of the time, indeed, I think it is the case for all of us. And so we, want, we concluded by really reminding ourselves that God is always looking for a few good men and women to bear witness to him. Scripture tells us that out of thousands of people in the world, oftentimes the lamentation is that God cannot even find one. So the question is, are you that one person that God is looking for to bear witness for him in the most dark world. Now today we go on to chapter 13 and chapter 13 gives us a, a just one key incident or narrative which is the separation of Abraham and Lot. And from there, as usual, we can draw a lot of wonderful lessons as well. Let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer and commit the time to him. Let us pray. We thank you, O oh God, for allowing us to come here this morning. We do want to ask that you grant to us a heart that is at peace with you, for you are our Lord God and the provider of everything we have in life, including the very breath that we are taking right now. So grant to us a heart that is as humble as a little child, so that we can come before you, listen to your word, and have your word enter into our hearts and not resist you with our pride or even with our sense of failures in our life. Help us, O oh God, to truly be obedient to your word. Have special mercy on your unworthy servant. May the words of his mouth and the meditation in all our hearts and minds be deemed acceptable in your sight. For you are God and our Redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before I go into the text proper, which actually is quite simple, right? You know, second responsive reading, you have read it through, you sort of already know what happened. But some background information would be appropriate. The first thing is that we have these two characters. One is Abraham, where yeah, Abrahamic faith, very important. Everybody sort of know him. Lot was someone who is sort of less well-known. Lot's father, Haran, was the younger brother of Abraham. We see from Scripture, Genesis 11, the earlier chapter, verse 27. Now, these are the generations of Terah, which is the father of Abraham. Terah fathered Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. So, in terms of order, Haran will be a younger brother, and Haran fathered Lot. So, therefore, uh, Lot would be a nephew of Abraham. But the father died quite young, 20, verse 28. Haran died in the presence of his father, Teran, in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. So before Abraham was called by God, Lot's father already died. And he died very young. And from the kind of tradition that the people had back in those days, Abraham would have taken care of Lot as if he was his own son. So this is an important point for you to remember. So when God then called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 that we have read, now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Verse 4 says, So Abram went, that time his name was still Abram, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took his wife and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set up to go to the land of Canaan. So that was one of the reasons why we said Abraham was a wealthy man when he was called, because he had many people that he had acquired, meaning they were like slaves or servants that he had when he was in Haran. But you know that at that time, Lot was considered part of his family and he, he, he was, Abraham was caught and Lot just went with him. And not only that, he was considered someone who was mentioned together with the kind of possessions that Abraham had, meaning he had a very special position in a family, that he was like a son. So based on the olden days of writing, especially in the days of Moses when this was written, for Lot to be mentioned meant that he was considered a son, a person who was going to inherit all the possession. And that's why every time Abraham was mentioned in the earlier chapters, Lot was mentioned at the same time. Now we go on to today's passage in Genesis chapter 13. We know that there was a famine and so Abraham and his wife went to Egypt in chapter 12 and 
Remember always that as great as Abraham was, he was not a perfect man, right? So when he was in Egypt, he told lies to the Pharaoh and then the Pharaoh thought that the wife was a sister. You know, the wife was quite old, you know, and still looked really good. So back in those days, you can be 60, 70, no need plastic surgery, you can still look really, really good. So what happened was that then the Pharaoh finally found out that actually this Sarah was the wife, not the sister and he got really frightened. And so he gave Abraham even more gifts and sent him back. And so verse 13, chapter 13, verse 1 says, So Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had. And again, Lot, you see the word Lot is there, signifying that he's, he was really three part of the family, into the Negev. Now Abraham was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. So originally he was rich. Went to Egypt, told a lie. Pharaoh made a mistake and was so frightened that God would punish him. So gave him even more gold and more silver. So he became even richer. And jumping to verse 5, And Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. So putting all the verses together, what happened was that Abraham treated Lot like a son and enabled Lot to be wealthy as well. Because his father died young, and so he took Lot in as his own, and he had no children of his own. Not only did he treat him well, he also gave him his possession as well. In the end, Lot was also a person who had much possession. And of course, then when we read in chapter 13, as time went by, lots of problems happened. The land became scarce in terms of providence for the flock and the servants of Abraham and Lot began to fight. So Genesis chapter 13 verse 8 says, Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen, meaning we are relatives. Let's not fight together. Is not the whole land before you. Separate yourself from me, and here comes the part that is interesting. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. Now remember, Abraham was like a father to Lot. And he brought him up because Lot's own father died young. Gave him everything. Brought him along. Possession shared with him. The guy is quite good. So he is able to make his flock grow and his so the empire started to grow as well. And then there was a dispute, not between Abraham and Lot, huh? but between the servants of both men. And Abraham now said, look here, let's solve this problem. We depart. How, how do we do this? Abraham said, very simple. You get first choice of the land. You go right, I go left. You go west, I go east. It was a most generous offer that was given to Lot. And not only was it a generous offer, it was something that probably was unheard of. Because here you have this guy who is supposed to be a father figure to Lot, not only being generous, but giving Lot the first bite of the pie and do it the other way around. You take this, I take that. You, know, you, you take whatever you want, I will take the leftover. And the, in the Bible, the astonishing thing was seen in verse 10. And Lot lifted up, lift up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zohar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other. This was the most amazing thing actually when I read about this. So guy really in Hokkien is bokeh here because the old man said, you pick, you know, and he went after it. I was thinking to myself, did Abraham say this because it's a Chinese thing to say or the Asian thing to say, right? Never mind, you eat first, you eat first, you sit, you sit, you sit, you sit first. And this young guy immediately jumped and chose for himself. Of course, the Bible did not mean that Abraham did it out of courtesy or out of cultural trait. But he did it because he honestly think that it's okay with him, you know, let this guy choose what he wants. The astonishing thing, of course, was that he did it. And so in verse 12, the Bible says, Abram settled in the land of Canaan, which was like a lousy piece of land. 
no fertility, no resources of any sort, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now, later in Genesis, we will read about Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where everything started to go haywire because Lot chose the fattest, the best, the fertile land for himself. Doesn't matter what happened to Abraham, this old guy who brought me up. And this is in stark contrast to Abraham's grace and generosity because Lot took full advantage of Abraham, who was like a father to him. And this is all the more remarkable, because we are talking about a situation in a Middle Eastern culture where the respect for the elderly was expected. We know that because when you go back to Genesis 9, and you look at how the sons of Noah treated Noah when he was in a sort of drunkard stage, you know that this kind of respect situation is deeply entrenched in the Middle Eastern culture. But I must tell you that when I was preparing for the sermon, I discovered that there is a different treatment to this passage depending on whether your Bible scholar is from the West or from the East, you know. All the Western, American, British Bible scholars who wrote about Genesis chapter 3 did not put a lot of emphasis on this idea that Abraham was the elder father-like figure to Lot. They treated Abraham and Lot as if they were just equal people, and that, you know, Lot was just being greedy, and, and that's about it. Whereas all the Bible scholars of the East, the Asian ones, they were like, how can this be? You know, Abraham is like your father, okay? So why are you doing all these things to him? So there is a marked, recognizable differences in treatment based on cultural traits. If you are Western trained, you probably look at this as something which is much simpler to deal with, just disagreement between two persons. However, if you are from Asia, you will recognize a violation of the Asian mode of understanding that, you know, you don't do this to your father. You don't do this to somebody who is more elder than you. So, because of that, I would want this morning for us to look at the reflections on biblical idea of kinship. Because... One of the things we need to recognize is that the way we behave in life, the way we understand scripture even, are often influenced by our cultural traits, the things that influence us in our lifetime. And that will result in the way we even worship, the way we treat each other, the way we understand certain portions of scripture. And the incident of Abraham and Lot gave us a very good opportunity to really study deeply into what does it mean in terms of interpersonal relationship, especially for all of us as Asian. Now, most of the, my congregation members are Chinese, of Chinese descent, and this is the one culture trait that I am most familiar with because I'm very bicultural, so I'm going to focus largely on this. But you know that no matter where you come from, there are different cultural tra traits. And so from the Chinese cultural traits and the way we are influenced in terms of understanding the Bible and the way we live our life, you can actually apply it across all cultures. So understand that I'm trying to show you the general principles here. In the Chinese cultural traits, when we look at the situation of Abraham and Lot, our instinctive ideas are influenced by the Asian Confucian kind of a understanding. When we use words like this, it doesn't mean that it was just one person, Confucius, who has influenced our thoughts, but a collection of many, many different thinkers along China's very long history, especially for those of us who are of Chinese descent. But among them all, Confucius had a most unusual position because he was the guy who sort of gathered a lot of all these thoughts together and pushed it very strongly. And remember in the last sermon about Easter, talk about founding religious leader. Confucius did it for almost 50 years of his life, going all over the world. And he did it at a time that was the most difficult because traveling was a very difficult thing because Confucius was born more than 500 years before Jesus Christ during the warring time, warring dynasties of China. That was like a long, long time ago. And Confucius decided that he would spend his entire life gathering together some of the teachings that he had learned from the Shang dynasty and the Zhou dynasty because he believed that to be most effective to elev elevate the living standards 
of the Chinese of his time. Now, when you even use the word Chinese, you're talking about different Chinese in so many different warring dynasty. And a lot of people look at Confucius and say, okay, he's like a religious leader, but actually he was not because Confucius' emphasis really was on family and social harmony as opposed to spirituality. Confucius thought that actually he doesn't know anything about spirituality because he doesn't even know death. He doesn't even know life. So how would he know about death? So he was only interested largely on human relationship. How do you have a system of thoughts and behavior pattern for all of China so that we don't keep killing each other, we, so that the whole society can move on together? So much of Confucianism actually is humanistic in nature and not religious in nature. And this is one of the reasons why the influence is so wide. And you would think that Confucius influenced China. Not so. He influenced Korea and Japan greatly as well. Now, all of you who watch just all these Korean drama show, right, you know that in the Korean drama show, even the way they speak to the elderly has, they use different terms. I don't know, I watch the subtitle, so I'll say that different term. You should use this term. You cannot say you, me. Uh, and in a Chinese concept, in, I'm a Hainanese. We follow some of this, you know. When a Hainanese refers to himself, he don't use the word wa, wa means me. And if the other person is elderly, you are supposed to use nong, which is a more humble, I so know Hainanese around nodding your head. <laughs> nong means it's a more humble term. So even terminologies are different. So in Japan, in Korea, this influence remains till today. And Confucius and his many gangs of followers and different teachers parallel to him wanted to implement a system of behavior pattern in everyday life in harmony with the laws of heaven. So, of course, his teachings are very grand and very profound, and the scope is really, really wide, and so it's kind of difficult to pick and choose some of the more important ones. But relevant to today's teaching, I want to tell you that there are at least two broad areas that, that is relevant to the biblical subject today. The first concept is Ulun, which is the idea that there are five different relationships in life, and there's only five, according to him. The first is Jin Chen, between your emperor and your subject. So Confucianism prescribed a fixed kind of behavior pattern between an emperor and a subject. It doesn't mean that the emperor can do anything he wants. The emperor also have a behavior pattern. But the concept is that if you are a subject, you better be very loyal to the emperor. So Jin Yao Chen Shi, Chen Bu Dei Bu Shi. So if the emperor asks you to go and kill yourself, you must say, Xie Zhu Long, and thank you very much that you have given me this privilege to hang myself because of you. So that kind of a concept. Second is father and son. So the relationship with the father and son is also pretty prescribed. And so as a son, you better don't talk back to your parents or whatever kind of thing because Fu Zi, the, the relationship is very sacred. And then there are others between husband and wife and then between siblings and the last one is between your friends and anybody else. That's like a last category. And Confucianism teach, teaches that in all this, there are fixed manner of behavior pattern. And so when Lot did this to Abraham, those of us who are influenced by Confucianism, very Asian, would be, how can you do this? This is called botua bosue. No big, no small. <laughs> you, 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 you have jump over the kind of system that is ingrained in our culture for thousands of years. Same thing, when you go talk back to your parents or whatever it is, it's like, how can you do this? I don't know, at least my generation is like this. Sometimes I think that I must be careful because you, you may look at me and say, Xiao, <laughs> no such thing, man. I talk by my parents every day. In traditional Chinese understanding, that's like crazy, man. How can you say that to your parents, you know? Do that to your parents. And it, it permeates all aspects of our life is in the drama show, is in, in the Chinese wayang, is in your, your proverbs, in your chen yu, everything. And so in these five relationships, Confucianism then proposed that it then expressed itself in what is called pata, which is the earth, eight most important virtues in life as you maintain this relationship. The very first listed is xiao which is not, not ki xiao the xiao, ah, but xiao as in filial piety. Then you look at it, xiao, ah, where got such thing? <laughs> filial piety, xiao, xiao sun the xiao. Second one is ti. Ti means 
between relationship between brothers. So even between siblings, there is a firm relationship. If you are the firstborn, you have a lot of responsibility. You have to take care of the family, quit your school, and make sure that your kids, your, your siblings get to go to school because that's part of the T kind of a, a, a relationship and your virtue. And Zhong is the next one where you have to be loyal. So Jin Chen you, is, is root together with the idea of loyalty and Xing, which is integrity. This is an important virtue. The last four is the one that Singaporeans are more familiar with because many schools lift it up on their school <laughs> hall. Li Yi Lian. What's the last one? Yeah, those of you who are from Chinese background school know. Li means the proper right. So there are rules and regulations in the way we treat each other. For example, when you look at an elderly person, you are supposed to greet them. So some of the Chinese-oriented schools in Singapore still have that. I sometimes go to school to give talks, and when you walk on a corridor, the kid look at you and then they will bow to you. And some just pretend to bow and then run away. But it's part of the school thing. Then you keep bowing to everybody. If they bow you, you bow, 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 bow. By the time you reach the hall, your neck is very tired. It's a lead. It's very straight. Uh, to some extent, we still implement in schools, right? Are we still doing this? You go inside, everybody stand up. Good morning, Mr. Young. You do that. And sometimes the pan zhang or the class monitor will do it. Is it still done? Qi li, you don't know what, xing li, and then zuo xia or something like that. Is it still done? I think so, right? So you can see how strong the influence of traditional culture is in our everyday life. Uh, but the one that is so-called kind of out of the window these days is actually the last one, ci. Men should say, ren yao zi ci er li, meaning in your life you must know what shame is, then you can live life, you can establish your life. But as I preach to you often, we have entered into an era where we are in a shameless era, right? It is a shameless thing, right? You have the most powerful man in the United States, uh, most powerful man in the earth, the United States president. He has like, what, three or four porn star every single day bugging him about the things that he has done. He's still president. Nobody, he's not being impeached, right? It all started with Bill Clinton. So the idea of shame it's no longer a big deal. These days, you look at the newspaper, you look, oh, yeah, another primary school principal get arrested because he visited underage prostitute or whatever. He's like, oh, yon, yon, any more news, new, better news? Because you're quite used to it. So, the Yi Lian the last one, is the one that has been thrown out of the window. But among the part, the most influential one would be the very first one. And somehow, a lot of focus through the years has been placed on filial party. One of the reasons is because of the way the Chinese society is structured under an agricultural kind of a system where there can be great famine and great problems and poverty and, and what have you. And so the idea that you need to be filial to your parents took on special significance because it can ensure survivability of your entire race. And so the Chinese place a lot of focus on this. The Asian place a lot of focus on this, not only in China, in Korea, in Japan. And it influences every aspect of life. These days when people get married, you seldom pick, you check, check the background in the sense that what business is the guy in and, and whether you can survive because are you marrying to a rich family or poor family? But actually, in ancient days, the first thing you need to check when you want to marry someone, who knows? What's the first thing? The, the what? What do you say? The, the length. The length. The land. No, 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 no. The first thing you check is the surname. Yeah. So I'm young, right? If my daughter come back and tell me that, hey, daddy, I have a boyfriend. First thing, what's his surname? If he's, the guy is at Atan Akao, never mind. The guy young also, young, then... What's the second question? Who knows? So if my, my daughter comes back and says she has a boyfriend, boyfriend is also young, same surname as me, what would be my second question? What is his what? Hey, yo, you're not very Chinese. <laughs> oh, I forgot your Indonesian Chinese. Dialect. What is his dialect? So if the fellow is a Hainanese too, then oh dear. Next question. Which part of Hainan Island did his ancestor come from? so as to ensure that the lineage is, don't have close relation marriage. And some people propose that's one of the reasons why the Chinese IQ is higher than many other races. 
because we are very sensitive. Hey, don't laugh, you know, got doctors here, right? Two doctors here, go and ask them. Because we are very careful and very sensitive about this through the ages. Intonation, am I being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> Intonation have a problem because many Intonations have only one name. Correct? One name. So therefore, you are not able to trace the lineage. And I don't know, by some odd whatever, you could marry someone who is really closely related to you, you know. So therefore, through the years and through the generation, your IQ keeps falling. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be edited out of the, the thing. <laughs> However, the idea of filial party reaches a stage of obsessive kind of attention. So much so that the Chinese propose many stories, many different tools to drum into the mind of our Chinese young people the importance of filial party. The most important of which is the 24 stories of filial piety or the earth is xiao. It was so important that it appeared on postage stamps. <laughs> like this is the postage stamp of Taiwan, where the 24 stories of filial piety is a collection of filial piety stories through the ages, through many different dynasties. And so the idea is to, to drill it into your child's mind. Uh, you know, in the West, you tell stories, Snow White and the Seven Dwarf, and that kind of live heavily ever after type, right? Uh, China, not so. Uh, I'm talking about traditional China. Or, or, or even Japan or Korea. You tell stories of the 24 Xiao or the 24 filial party. Every one of the story is about some guy who is so filial to the parents until it's kind of ridiculous kind of a stage. So that your kid will remember that. It's not about Snow White, you know, about Seven Door, Prince Charming. These days all gone, like your kid all dressed up like Elsa and whatever you just say. Gone case really. But my days, even when I was growing up, my father would keep telling me about the story of the guy with the wooden bow and all that. It's not part of the 24. He, I think he invented the story himself. Something like when, when the guy's parents is old, he went to carve a wooden bow for the pa father to eat. So his son said, hey, daddy, what are you doing? He said, you're carving a wooden bow for your grandpa. Because the grandpa keep dropping the porcelain bow and breaking it, you know, because he's so old and so stupid. So one day he saw his own son doing the same thing. He said, what are you doing? They're carving a bow for you. you know? Who are my father repeat this story to me at nauseum man, all my life. He said, okay, yeah, la, I know. La, I know I'm not going to carve a wooden one. I'm just going to give you a plastic one. Will, you know? <laughs> so, so that. But the 24 Xiao story is, is very extreme. One of the most extreme is this particular story. My Er Feng Mu is about a guy called Guo Qi, who, first of all, his father died. Then he has two other brothers, right? So what he did was to tell the brothers that I'm, I don't want to send from my father's inheritance. I'm going to give it all to poor for you. You're split it. What I want is mother. I want to be the one who take care of mother. Then the two brothers very happy. Okay, go, go, go. Take care of mother. And lo and behold, because he gave away everything and no money, right? So as he was taking care of his mother, they became very poor because they had no money. And, and then his wife got pregnant and had a son. And he notices or noticed that his mother would not eat too much because, you know, she's trying to preserve food for his own son, you know. And he was greatly distressed because he's so filial to the mother. Guess what he did? He went to discuss with the wife. He said that this son of ours uh, is a jia liao bi uh, He's going to eat up all the rice. So therefore, uh, we should bury him so as to preserve my mother. It's like all the women uh, <laughs> So uh, I tell you, when you pick your boyfriend next time, I uh, better ask him whether you know this story or not. Very important. Because for Guo Qi, this guy, his mother is more important than his own son. And lo and behold, the wife said, okay, carry on. <laughs> so they went to dig a hole to try to bury their son for the purpose of saving food for his mother. I know when you hear this, like, that means you all have not heard it before. But to me, I grew up with this sort of thing. And like all good story, like I see Dick the, the whole, can you see the thing? There's this yellow thing. Guess what he discovered? Go. Yeah, it's a very Chinese thing. So he did, 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 go because he's so filial that heaven thought, well, this is not bad. Give him some go. And then they live happily ever after because he discovered go. But isn't the point horrifying that he would want to <laughs> practice infanticide just to save his own mother? And the 24 cell story all are this sort of category. Some are one or two quite mild, but a lot of them are this kind of extreme stuff, like lying naked on the on the frozen river so that the river will melt so that you can catch a fish for your mother. 
Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> like, like in summer, going to sit beside your parents' bed and take out your shirt so that the mosquito will bite you instead of your mother. That kind of thing. Uh, one more. Like, this guy, his father is, is dying and sick, and then the doctor tell him, hey, you know, uh, human waste can tell you how sick the person is. Further go and eat the father's waste so as to know whether it's sweet or sour or taste. I don't know whether you got diabetes or whatever kind of thing. Can you imagine that the 24? Some of you look at me so incredulous. This is on postage stamps, okay? Excuse me. You know, it's celebrated. It, it, it is a celebrated thing in the world of the Asian Confucian influence world. And so because of all these things, the Asian place special emphasis on relationship between the elderly, the young people all together. So much so that we have many different terms, isn't it? You look at the Chinese family tree, for example. How do you address each other? It's very complicated. Like this chart is, is like between you, me, what should you call each other? There are many different terms, right? Su Su, Shen Shen, Biao Yi, Biao Ge, whatever. And that's within your immediate family. You want to extend it further, there are different terminology to address someone who is elderly on your father side. Even the father side. So, so small, I can't see. <laughs> so you have all these different poor, 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 fool, different things. Everybody has a different name and a different form of address. This is only your father side. Down here, mother side. So mother side, another thing altogether. So everybody is different. You do not, you must remember what to call them. So Chinese New Year, a lot of you are familiar. I don't know about you, but mine, same. You, you, you go to visit someone you're supposed to, before you arrive, especially in Hainanese, you need to tell them, this person is this, this, this. And then sometimes you got number, one, two, three, four. You know, san gu, san, san gu pa po, or whatever it is. San gu liu po. It, it, ranking and, and different thing, tai gong, tai zu, whatever. Guess what? This differ from dialect to dialect. This is the one for Hokkien. The terminology is different from the Cantonese, different from the Hainanese, different from the Teochew or whatever. It is. So it's a very, very complicated world in the Chinese side. And so our emphasis on relationship and cultural traits is very, very strong. But when you look at the West, much simpler. Everybody's an uncle or auntie. That's all. And, and the chart is like, if you go to the right, it's uh, the third auntie, third uncle, or whatever it is. And the other terminology is just cousins, nephew, niece, end of story. A third cousin removed from, third cousin removed, second cousin, that's about it, you know. Very, very simple. So when you go and visit someone, all you have to do is uncle, auntie, end of story. No need to remember what, piao yi zhang, piao gu, piao whatever it is, or tang, or whatever it is. So a lot less emphasis. And so, when it comes to the Christian faith then, because of the clash of these two kind of a culture, there arise many, many misconceptions of Christianity. The chief among all is that Christianity is a Western kind of faith. Because you look at Abraham and Lot, how can it be that you just allow Lot to do all this type of nonsense and you know, it's a very Western kind of concept. And Christianity does not promote filial piety since it does not allow the most important of them all, ancestor worship, let alone this kind of addressing and, and respect for each other. And this is a very real issue. Some couples that come before me for marriage prep struggle with issues like that because either one party, the parents are Taoist or whatever it is, and then you get into a lot of difficulty because they will say that, hey, you're marrying a Christian. These people don't respect the elders and they don't do anything for their ancestors. That Christianity promotes individualism, don't quite care about the family. That Christians do not care for their family. Even pastors sometimes will use Matthew 10, 37 as an example. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves sons or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Jesus Christ proclaimed that. And so people say, see, 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 therefore we don't care about our family. Don't you care so much? Huh? We care for the church more. So got money, we better give to the church first and don't quite care about the family. I want to be very clear about this. 
when we look at the Bible, these are misconceptions. The first thing you need to know about God's truth on kinship is clearly, clearly, clearly seen in the Ten Commandments. Now, I don't know whether you know this or not. The Ten Commandments are actually segregated into two broad areas. On the left would be commandments relating to God. On the right would be commandments relating to human relationship. So four on the left and six on the right. And the very, very first commandment given relating to human relationship is thou shalt honour your father and mother. So let it be very clear that the Bible places among all relationship filial piety as number one. In the words of the Bible, honour is being used. Not go and bury your son just to save your mother, kind of uh, extreme idea. However, the idea is that the honouring of father and mother is definitely a clear biblical teaching. And not only that, of course, many, 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 many places in the Bible talk about how we need to respect our elderly, we need to serve one another and help those who are within our own community as well. And I've given to you in the focal passage, the passage from 1 Timothy 5, which is crystal clear. The Apostle Paul was advising young Timothy, he was a young guy, about how he should live his life especially in light of the community of the church, the new form community of faith, the ecclesia, where the people of God gather together. First Timothy 5.1 Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. So actually, Confucianism taps on some of this kind of idea. And Paul then says, Honour widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Meaning that if you have a mother who is just widow or a grandmother who is just widow, it is your responsibility to take care of her. This is what Paul says. Not just throw them to the church and ask the church to carry on with it. And then he had a line on widows who are, are truly left all alone. Set, she has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. So this relates to widows who are taking advantage of other people. Command these things as well so that they may be without reproach. But verse 8 is important. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household. What did Paul say? He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so let it be crystal clear about this that the Bible expects us to honour our father and mother and treat them with respect and to provide for our own family members and not have a situation whereby they are left all alone and desperate because you say, I'm serving God, so therefore I give every cent I have to God, and so too bad for all of you, because I love Jesus more than I love you. The Bible is very clear about this. When Jesus Christ talked about love, of course he was talking about the ultimate love that we ought to have in our life, because he is God. But at the same time, the Bible is clear. Do not use that as a stupid excuse to say that you don't have to take care of your family, you don't have to respect your parents, you don't have to, to deal with them because you're so busy serving God and loving other people. The Apostle Paul says, if you do that, you are worse than an unbeliever. There are, of course, many, many other verses and you can spend your time, you will find so many, hundreds and hundreds of verses that talk about how we ought to treat our own family members with respect in a way that is not lesser than the Confucian kind of... Uh, understanding without their extreme obsessive kind of emphasis that got nothing to do with the truth. In the end, as I preach to you often, the Bible is talking about how we should never walk alone in our faith journey. And so the family, the community of faith is important. Now I want to tell you, sidetrack a little bit to say a word on this idea of voluntary kin. I have preached often that the journey of faith should not be walk alone, right? So therefore, you should be in a cell group, you should be in a church, you should be with a group of people. 
it remains true that some of us will be single, not married, will not have children. What does that mean then? How do you then practice some of the, the things that the Bible say? One of the things I came across is the word voluntary kin, which is an interesting concept altogether. These are people who have chosen to be related to each other. So you may have no blood relationship, but you are voluntary kin, like a kind of uncle to someone. Or using some of the words that we use today, you become a god uncle, god auntie, god father, which is a very Chinese kind of a concept. These are concepts which are actually very powerful and very real. For example, married couples and families should consider kinship with a single person or two so that the community and the walking of faith together can be extended to someone who biologically would not have any kinship of his own. In the same manner, single folks can reach out to a family or married couples building deep relationship through sacrificial service. So we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ because we are spiritual brothers and sisters. Voluntary kinship model proposes that we should bring it a little bit further where you accept someone who is not blood relation to you really as if that person is your actual sister or your actual brother. And so the journey of faith for single people especially would be addressed very much so. So the Bible is very, very clear about the importance of kinship. And so then what about the cultural traits that we talk about, all these things that we mentioned about Confucianism and the various way we handle our culture. Is it true that Christianity is Western, doesn't follow our kind of Chinese culture? One of the things that you need to know is that Christianity actually is not Western. It originated from the Middle East. So at best, you can say that it's a Middle Eastern kind of a faith not a Western Caucasian faith. But the more important point that I want to bring across this morning is that Christianity really is not about geography, it's not about culture, it's not about race, language, or tradition. Our faith transcends all things, and it is really all about the truth of God. And let this be made very clear. I mentioned earlier that in the preparation of this morning's sermon, I realized that Western scholars think one way, Eastern scholars think another way, showing us how important cultural traits are. They really influence us to a very, very large extent. But you need to understand that that's not what the reality is. The reality of our faith is that Christianity transcends cultural traits, and anything else because it is about the truth of God. We see this very clearly in the Bible, especially in Revelation. When the Apostle John saw the vision of the final judgment, he wrote, After this I look, and behold, a great multitude that no one could, remember, could number, from every nation, from every tribe, all people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. In other words, when the final day comes, you will find the people of God from all cultural background. They be white and black and Chinese or Indians or Bangladeshi, Pakistani, whatever it is. Not only that, from all different cultural practices. This group of people may worship God in the way we worship, very solemn. The other group of people may worship God in a dancing manner. I don't know whether rolling on the floor counts or not, but, you know, different style. If you are in Africa, you belong to the Maasai tribe. I think that when you worship, you will keep jumping up and down because that's what they do. Maybe with a spear in their hand or something. And it's all different cultural traits from all nations, from all tribes, all people, and all languages. When we then look at our cultural practices then, remember this, as with everything in life, whether it's culture, it's politics, it's business, everything that we do in life, if the cultural practices, tradition, norms, and all these things are consistent with God's truth, as revealed in His Word, then we can accept those practices. For example, the Chinese idea of respect for the elderly. Is it consistent with biblical teaching? The answer is yes. And so those traits are good traits that we can use. So in my own family, for example, my daughters, before they eat, will always address me and my wife first. Do you still do that at home? Some of you do, some don't. 
and I would not allow them to use words like, okay, everybody eat. No such thing, okay? You go and address one by one, akong, ama, abada, one by one, one by one. They say, ah, by the time you finish all that, the food all cold already. No. It's a cultural trait that really reinforced the idea of respect for those who had brought you up. A grace, the acknowledgement of the grace that God has given to you. And it translates actually finally to the respect towards what God has given to us in our life. So trait like that, when it is consistent with God's truth, we accept. But we reject any cultural trait that are against God's truth. Like bearing your son in order to save your mother. Come on. You know, that's crazy. So what, you find a pot of gold. <laughs> that's not the point, right? So you need to have wisdom to know. When we go back to the example of Abraham and Lot, why did Abraham do something that is so different from his Middle Eastern kind of a culture? The answer is because he understood this very well. Abraham, like all great men and women of God, he understood this as though he was not stuck with cultural norm, even though he lived in a time where cultural norm was so very, very strong. And so cultural practices should always be viewed as tools and we shouldn't apply it without proper thoughts. Like worship service, some of the way we worship are actually cultural traits because we are Reformed Evangelical and much of our tradition comes from Northern European tradition. The missionaries were all from Ireland or England or Northern European tradition. So you will notice that Reformed churches are largely white in colour. Do you notice that? If our missionaries were from China, or Jesus Christ born in Beijing instead of Jerusalem, I guarantee you the church will be green, red, maybe a few dragon here and there, kind of a thing. It's a cultural trait. And so you need to have the wisdom to understand what are relative issues and what are absolute issues. When the traits are thought of as two, it also means that you do not just discard any cultural trait without much thought to it. Some people think that, oh, because you think, we, we say that Christianity is above all else. So we should not then follow Chinese tradition anymore. For example, Chinese New Year. Some extreme charismatic church get very upset because you give away Ang Pao, red packet. Because they say, I trace the red packet back to the days where the Chinese think that red color can chase away the devil. So it's terrible. Don't have red packet. Don't do anything. And my answer is always, it's okay. You don't want to give it to me. I will collect it from you. But of course, we must have some wisdom as to some of the, the ideas, whether it has crossed a certain line or not, and exercise wisdom. And that's where the tricky part is. How do you exercise the wisdom? It's a tough, tough thing to do. But to say then that I don't care, doesn't matter, so long as it's Chinese, I'm not interested. We just want something that is biblical. Violate also pretty commonsensical thinking. There is a church that I used to preach in in Geelang area. So they sort of have this idea. So what do they do? When they have their choir, they actually have six girls who will do some form of dancing. And they are dressed up as if they are from the Middle East. Why? Because they will point to the Psalms and say, the psalm says you're going to use the tambourine and the lyre and, and all kind of thing. And it's like, man, you guys speak Chinese, right? So why are you doing this? So some of these things are pretty tricky. Neither should they be discarded without proper thought. No matter how you cut it, I will tell you that at the end of the day, you need to do everything based on the truth. And it is about the truth that will determine all things else. And under the truth of God then, all cultural traits and cultural practices become just two. You must know from the example of Abraham and Lot that God is always with people who follow his truth. This is because God is truth. In the particular case of Abraham and Lot, we can see that Lot's greed and this respectful attitude led to him and his family being married up with the decadence of Sodom. In later chapters, you will find that to be the case. Because Lord chose, chose the fatter part of the land without any respect, without any discussion, without any thought about the consequences, at the end of the day, he and his daughters and wife suffered the consequences of being so close to such a sinful city. In this particular case, Abraham chose 
or didn't choose. Abraham seems to have left with a lesser portion or something that was not as good. However, God was with him. And this was extremely clear in the Bible. As we read in verse 14, the Lord then said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, westward, for all the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring as the dust of the earth, so that one can count the dust of the earth, your offspring also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and the breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. Isn't this amazing? Abraham asked Lord to pick a land. Lord picked the best, leaving with him the rest, or not so good land. And yet, that was the land that God said was, will be given to you and God's blessing will be upon it. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the key question is not about our cultural value, our choices in life, our opinion, where we are, what we can own. The key question you really need to ask yourself all the time is whether in all that you are doing, are you with God and His truth? Because where God is, God's blessing will be at. So through your life, there will be many challenges, many voices from many people telling you what to do, including your own cultural background. Do not be afraid when you choose to stand on the side of the truth the way Abraham did. On the surface, he may have seen to have picked a land that is not so good. But because God is, was with him, so the blessing went with him instead of Lot. So all the things that surround us in our life, whether our culture, our material things, the immaterial things, every single thing, when we submit it completely to the Lord, God will be with us. The question to ask ourselves is not whether God is with me, but really whether I am with God. May we learn to subject everything we do in life after the sovereign will of God. And by so doing then, live a life that is pleasing to Him and a life that is indeed blessed. Let us pray. We thank you, God, for the word that we heard this morning. We do want to ask that you continue to speak to us in our heart after the voice of the preacher should end. For you are true and living God. We know, O Lord, that there are so many voices all around us. Some of them pure evil. Others are more subtle, like our cultural practices, the way we have been brought up, the many sayings in our race, in our dialect group, in whatever it is that we have been brought up with. Help us, O oh God, to have the wisdom to understand that whatever it is, all truths are God's truth, and that we are to subject everything under the banner of your truth. And in so doing then, know which direction we should go in life, May we understand that everything that you've given to us ought to be used as tools. May we have the wisdom to segregate what are things that are in accordance to your truth and what are falsehood of the world. And in so doing then, live the life that you have meant for us to live. We give you thanks and praise for you have given us resources beyond our understanding, the enjoyment of our culture, our life, the way we should behave. Grants to us a heart that is appreciative for you give us the greatest gift of them all, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has brought us into a new and living way. May our entire life be a testimony to your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.